it's a reminder that in, in a lot of ways statics is like uh, electricity. It's a fundamental subject, really, that all engineers should know a little something about. I did take statics, uh, even as a chemical engineer, which probably not many chem chemical engineers do anymore. The problem is I can't remember anything. <laughs> it was not one of my better classes, but then it was not a class I really paid a lot of attention to. Back then, we had to take breadth electives. So you know, you had your major field, and then you had uh, you had to take classes in pretty much every area of engineering. And you did this in your sophomore year, and um, which is really interesting because here the model at UW is you don't even really start your major. Well, yeah, I guess you do in the first two years. You have to sort of pre-engineering. Um, but by the time I was a junior, I already had thermodynamics and. Number of the basic electric electricity, like the electric power class that we teach now, fourth year, we, we have classes like that. Second year, so third year and fourth year, just focused in the major. But I remember statics was uh, just a nightmare. Statics, graphics, you know, engineering, drawing, and organic chemistry. Those are my my big weak subjects. Organic chemistry was the worst. Talk about awful memories. I think you know, I got a C minus in that class. It was my lowest grade as an undergraduate. Um, I can't remember what I got in statics, but it probably was you know, higher than a B minus, maybe. <laughs> B or B minus. <clears throat> okay. Um, problems with statics, to be honest, is uh, centroids and moments of inertia, because I, I, I don't have a visual sense. I, I, I would not be a good mechanical design engineer, because I can't really see things in three dimensions. I can't draw. Um, but I have this ability to, I think, in numbers and words. You know, I'm a linguistic person, so I'm good at languages, you know, picking up foreign languages and, um, uh, and, and math, but I'm not good at geometry or uh, you know if I look at a three-dimensional like I'm, I was preparing for this class and looking at uh, three-dimensional force uh, systems of forces and it's very difficult for me to see uh, to resolve forces into components when the component is not on the page when it's going into or out of the page I just have a really difficult time is it depth something like that but uh, yeah that's always been hard for me so I, I never would have been and it wasn't, oh man, engineering drawing was uh, just awful for me. And uh, as it was, I think, for a lot of chemical engineers. Nowadays, you don't even have to take that. Okay, chemical engineers don't even do that anymore. Uh, I don't even know if they do uh, solid works. I'm not sure about chemical. Because you generally don't think in spatial you know, objects and spatial energy. Anyway, um, we'll see what we can do here with, with stacks. How was a thermo? How did y'all do on that? Not good. <laughs> not, not, not good. Not good. <laughs> did, did the thermo come back after? Uh, no. Yes, no? <laughs> it's in the process. Of it's in the process of coming back. Yeah. Well, you know, you may never use thermo again once you graduate. Depending on what you do, and, you know, you may never use solid mechanics again. The reference, um, but yeah. <laughs> so that's why you want to do the uh, FE exam early, you know, while the stuff is still at least partly fresh, because after a year or two or three or five or ten, it's just going to be gone, and then you find that you have to literally go back through your college and get all your textbooks and notes out to go over. Yes, sir. When do we register for it? Okay. You can register now. Yeah. Let's see. I think we're in the second, April, May, June. Um, you have to check to see uh, when it's offered here in the Seattle area. Um, but there should be a testing. There's like four or five in the area. I registered for the day after graduation. So Thursday, June 16th. 
Oh, oh, okay. June. Is that the earliest that you can do it? Uh, I don't think so. I think there's. I think that's on a couple of earlier ones, but only yeah, after, <laughs> after school. So. Yeah. Boy, I, I would. I would, boy, I, I, yeah, doing it now boy, while school is still on that would be really tough. Um, but yeah, right after, I would even do it after. You know, take some time in the summer. You know. That's hard to do too because you're, you don't really, really want to study, but at least you know you have a little more time and you know, you're starting your job in the daytime and then practice uh, at night. Um, but a lot of people do it in the senior year. Uh, I don't know how, but that's, that's pretty amazing. I haven't heard of any of our. Does anybody know? Has anybody taken it or know anybody that's done it for graduation? Yeah, yeah, so I, I know some people have done it just after. Yes? I know that in some programs it's actually like required to graduate, so they have to do it before graduation. Yeah, yeah, a lot of places do that now, and uh, that's that's really, uh, uh, Seattle U does that, Gonzaga does that, uh, SPU does that, I think even Wazoo may do it as well, but UW doesn't, and um, we, there's some hurdles we have to cross to actually do that. We, it has to be approved by the board of uh, trustees. Uh, is it the board of trustees? Like uh, the governing board of the university. Yeah. Any, anything that you do that where you would require a student to, uh, to do work outside of the university where they have to pay for it, that, that there's a special approval process that goes all the way up to the highest level of the university. And the reason being is that this is imposing a hardship on students, you're already paying tuition. And then you say, well, you gotta go take this exam and it's gonna cost you a couple hundred bucks or whatever, $175. You know, you're, you're adding something that it, it, it's an external fee and that, that's not, we, we just can't do that without special permission. Um, and uh, so we, we've not done that. I, we probably could get that approved. I, I'm not aware of any programs at UW that are requiring it. We have thought about doing that. Um, and in the other places that I know that we do require it, uh, the students don't have to pass, they just have to take it. And they have to show, a, uh, they have to sh show the uh, program chair or, or some the administrative office, they have to show proof that they paid, you have to show a receipt that you paid for the exam. Uh, but you don't have to pass and the university doesn't look at how individuals do. What, what, they, what they do is, um, if, you, if you take it through the university like that, as a requirement, the testing center will send a report to the university that just has an aggregate of, of how the students did on all the subject areas. So you don't see in how, what, how individuals did, but you see how the group as a whole. So you get to see, this, and this is really useful when you're trying to assess your program, you get to see where the weaknesses are, and that, tells us as, as teachers where we need to focus maybe more effort. Like if the, stu if, if the students did unusually low in thermo or you know, they, they do stellar in the statics part but not so well in thermo, then that tells us, well, maybe we need to focus a little more on thermo to get the... That's, that's really helpful. And it also is uh, something that ABET like, likes to see in the accreditation. So it's a kind of a feather in your cap when you go up for accreditation. Um, and we've looked at doing that, but uh, so far, nobody's wanted to have to go to the Board of, board of Regents. Board of Regents is the people that have to approve that. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe maybe they'll do it at some point. Um, it's still something, I don't know, requirement, you know, force, making it a requirement like that. Um, I don't like that. I don't like being forced. To, the only reason why I would want to do that is, is so that our students are competitive with graduates from SPU and Seattle U. And, and I do know, because I work with HVAC, I do know that the HVAC industry likes Seattle U grads and they like Gonzaga grads because uh, the student, for some reason they, there's a sense of uh, these campuses are really serious about HVAC and uh, the subject matter around that and they, they really uh, encourage the students to take the FE and, 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 and target 
the PE, which you pretty much have to have in the HVAC field. And so these schools have sort of cachet, and I want our campus to be there. So I'm really working hard to try to build up our name and get uh, our students and our campus known in the community as a place where you know we prepare our students. There, they can do lots of things well. They can do HVAC well. So hire them. <laughs> you know we got a lot of good students and uh, and so that that's the reason why the only reason really is to you know it would make us perhaps. But I, nobody's told me. I've never heard from an employer. Oh, we, we would like you better if you made your students take the FE exam. Nobody's ever said anything like that. And I don't think anybody did. Things like that. It's like the SAT, you know, we're getting away from requiring SAT and stuff like that. Um, people argue about that. I don't know. Did y'all have to take the SAT? Yes. Yeah. There's, uh, you know, some people do really well on tests like that. And I'll, I'll give you a little clue here. I, I don't do well on those kind of tests. And uh, I, don't, I don't like doing multiple choice exams under pressure like that is really a really stressful experience. And I have some problems that probably when I was, you know, if I, if I were in, a, in school now, I, I would probably, because I, I tend, especially when I'm nervous and, uh, and tense like I am now, um, I have slight dyslexia, so I start to write backwards and I start to sort of see things, and I think in a weird, in a weird way. That's not good for taking a test under, under pressure. Okay. But actually, they do. I mean, nowadays, you, the, the, the FE exam, the PE exam, I mean, they do have uh, uh, accommodations for, for students. So, so you, you, as we do here, and, and most universities now have, you, you can, you know, if you have a a demonstrated need, um, they do have some accommodation, which is really, really nice. I'm so really happy about that. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, we got thermo. Um, statics. Statics is really simpler, a lot simpler than thermo to, to go over because there's just, there's not a lot of areas to it the way there is in thermo. Um, I think the most, uh, in terms of, you, know, you go through the review manual, and most of it is, is on uh, centroids and moments of inertia because, you know, you've got a, all these ge geometric shapes that you, you may have to do centroidal calculations or moments of inertia calculation. And uh, what you don't really need in stat statics, but we use those in dynamics and mechanics of materials, you know, if you're trying to understand uh, a, a body's ability to resist torsion or something. Polar moment of inertia, I think, is relevant. For, so you use these. Uh, what is it? Um, I actually use the moment of inertia when I do. Uh, God, is it sort of thermo or heat transfer? I can't remember what it is now. But um, so we kind of use them in other areas. But the the process of you know calculating the concept behind centroids and moments of inertia is developed in, uh, in statics. So we have these you know, tables that you have to look up for a shape, and uh, then you know use the parallel axis theorem if, the, if your object is displaced from the axis. And all, you know the, the FE reference handbook has those tables. You can look stuff up for selected objects. Um, so there's a, a you know a fair bit of practice that involves you know working with, with that. Um, so I'm gonna just go through here. What I what I put together for you for you all, and I you know I, I, I don't teach statics and I haven't taken it, so I don't know how this aligns with what you learn in, in class. I can tell you this: that statics is the one subject here that every ME professor is supposed to be able to teach. Those faculty agree that uh, that's the one subject. Um, if somebody gets sick or can't teach. Every one of us is supposed to be able to step up. That's the only class that's like that. And I, I just thank my lucky stars that no one has said, Carl, you need to teach statics. 
And I'm like, well, you know, I got another job opportunity over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the students and I can learn statics together. That'll be fun. <laughs> okay. Um, so on the on the mechanical exam, uh, this is one of the bigger subject areas. Not quite as big as this. Can't, uh, machine design or thermo, but it's, it's right up there. One, one fewer, one or two fewer, fewer questions. Um, and uh, there's about seven pages. Not, it's not a long part in the handbook. There's not a lot there. There's some formulas for forces and um, force systems and things like that. And then all the tables for moments. Um, and uh, the topics covered are uh, systems of forces, Moments and couples, equilibrium of rigid bodies. I'm making the main thing. You know, it's really uh, trusses, uh, static friction, um, and that gets into things like uh, screws and uh, uh, pulleys. Uh, just you know, figuring out tension and you know, ma maximum force before you actually start motion. Um, Things like that, and then centroids and moments of, of inertia. Okay, but uh, of course, it, but it really, it static starts with forces, and uh, this is where I, you know, I just want to go get a beer and sit and watch, uh, <laughs> watch an old movie or something. Because uh, what is this? No, that's a Z dimension. I put put myself in here and imagine myself dancing around inside this three dimensional box figure out what's going on. Actually, I spent a lot of time drawing this and rotating it and trying to, what's the best way to make this show up? You know, a lot of times you see something like this and all the all the components are the same color and you can't tell the component from the axis. I was like, I can't do it that way. Um, yeah, so hopefully that's, you can visualize that. But anyway, we, you know, we write out the force in three dimensions and uh, using vector terms. Uh, you know, the, 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 the resultant times the unit vector gives us this, right? And uh, so being able to represent uh, a force vector, or a force in vector notation, we can resolve the force into the three components um, and uh, each component is the product of the resultant and the, uh, and the, and the angle The angle between the uh, the force and the the axis of interest. So if you're interested in the z component, you'd be the cosine of the angle between the force vector and the z axis right here. Um, and then the, uh, the, the these angles uh, relate through this identity, this trigonometric identity here, because some of the cosines of the angle is equal to one, which can help if you need to find an angle from two to two known angles. Um, and then the force, another way of expressing force is through uh, the product of the result of the, uh, of the magnitude and the unit vector. And then the unit vector, uh, this represents the distance along the axis, right? So distance along the x plus distance along the y, distance along the z. And you divide through by the sum of the square root of the sum of the squares. And sometimes uh, we need to use this form if we don't know the angles, right? Um, so here's our, uh, our our resultant, or or the magnitude, not the resultant, the magnitude of the force. I guess it's the result the resultant of the components, but it's the magnitude of the force factor. Um, and it's a lot easier, of course, if you just have two dimensions. And uh, at the exam, we'll have could have problems in two or three dimensions. Uh, system of the forces can be expressed as the vector sums. Now we're talking about multiple F1 to Fn uh, systems of forces. And uh, uh, so we, we just sum the component. We can express it in vector form by just summing the components. So all the little x components go with the i, the y components with the j, and so on. And uh, we open up these. Rx is just the sum of the x components of each force, and so on. And most of these equations are in the reference handbook. If you look at the reference handbook, it's right uh, 
somewhere here. So you can see, and then he's a little bit more uh, confusing <laughs> uh, formula, but uh, not resolution of force, uh, separating force into components, then the moments. So my notes, kind of, my notes follow, follow this, but with a, bit, a little bit more uh, elaboration, which I'm not as familiar. The, the way the Epi hand, handbook works, as you probably know by now, is it's great if you already know the subject really well, right? You don't need any explanation. You just need the uh, most general formula. But if you're not, you know, if you, if you don't know or you, you can't remember everything, then the reference handbook sometimes isn't all that helpful, or it doesn't seem to give you enough information. Um, but anyway, uh, so the magnitude and direction angles of the resultant uh, for the system of vectors are uh, expressed here, um, where the angles are the angles with respect to the to the axis, x, y, and z axis. And then I've got some examples here: um, the magnitude of the resultant of the three forces. Here, um, two-dimensional so we can write uh, we can resolve or we can write a, a sum <coughs> we the X component of the resultant will be the sum of the X component of the individual forces right so we've got a 200 Newton force um, so let's look at its X its X component is going to be what What's the X component of the 200 Newton force? Four fifths. Four fifths, right? And uh, so we have to come over and uh, either in our head or writing it down, you know, what the hypotenuse is there. So we've got a three, four, five triangle. And that's one we'll commonly see. And, you know, a 12, 5, 13 is another. Is that, that's right, isn't it? 13 for yes. Yeah, that's another one that pops up a lot. I don't know about the 20 degree one, but we'll come to that one. Okay, so we've got 200 uh, uh, it's four times four fifths plus, let's see, we go to the uh, 100 Newton vector. How, and how would we handle that one? What would the X component be? Minus 100 sine of 20. Is that good? Yeah, or cosine of 70, right? But I think if we do cosine 70, it would have to be plus, right? Is that the same thing? But this will do the job. And uh, we've got the, uh, the bottom one is, uh, what's the X component of that one? Times five over thirteen. Does this ring a bell? Is familiar? Yeah. Um, and uh, so we sum all that up, and we get seventy-five point eight. We'll do the same thing for the y. So what we're doing here is we're just summing the components of each one. So that's R x for the two hundred newton, and uh, R x for the one hundred newton force, and R x for the one hundred thirty. And then for the 
y component, 200 and uh, what's that going to be? 3 over 5. And then for the 100 Newton one, that's going up. So 20 times what? 20 times. Be 100 times cosine. Oops. Be plus 100 times cosine of 20. this uh, 94 newtons, my math is correct here, 94 newtons, and we're looking for the magnitude of the resultant, so the resultant is gives us uh, 121 newtons, right? For answer C. Okay, two dimensions, fine. Um, now uh, we get into, well for me at least, is the, the one I, I guess and skip. <laughs> That's probably what I would do. Or may I play with it, but come back to it if I have time. Uh, okay. Uh, so example two, what are the magnitude and direction angles? Okay, so this one is, uh, we're gonna, it's a little bit bigger than a probably an exam question would be because it's asking for a bunch of different parts here, but it's a good practice. Uh, so we've got uh, Yeah. 
pivot is 30 degrees with 30, respect yeah. to the to the I y. I thought that was so it's it's going to be negative. Um, okay. Uh, Yeah, what I what I did here was I, I used the identity um, cosine squared of uh, the uh, the x direction angle is equal to one minus cosine squared of the y direction angle minus cosine squared of um, the z direction angle. That's equal to one minus theta y is thirty, right? So cosine squared minus three over two squared minus. Uh, Check me here. I have 0.75 minus 0.03012 or 0.21988. Does that look right?
uh, similarly, F2Z we can handle pretty, pretty easily. It's uh, 100 times the cosine of 80, 80 degrees from the Z axis, right? Or uh, 17.4. That keg of beer. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday, or your favorite alternative beverage. <laughs> okay. I don't know. This is kind of you know it's kind of fun. Brings back memories of uh, when I was messing around with this stuff. Um, every once in a while, one of the things you do deal with if you're doing uh, HVAC work or anything that involves machinery is sometimes you have to. You deal with the uh, the flooring loads and things like that. Make sure you're not, you know, with motors and big fans. Make sure you're not going to crash, <laughs> crash through the floor. I never had a problem with that, but man, I had some electrical issues when I was first starting out as an engineer. I blew out a, uh, I blew out a, um, a breaker system in part of a factory I was working in. The, the whole uh, cell of the plant shut down because I overloaded the circuit. And for all these people, all these machine operators swearing and cursing and you know, you know, you went black, totally black for a few seconds. Then you know, the emergency the lights kicked on. Who did that? Collins. <laughs> Collins, get your butt in here. We used colorful language back then. <laughs> oh man, I had a. I was working as a, a, a control systems design group. Group leader was this old Navy guy, and uh, man, every other word was a swear word. And it's like it was all guys at the, at the time in that group. So, uh, but I can't even imagine today. You know, you, you just all kinds of <laughs> trouble would break out. Um, okay. Um, so we're, okay, so we're looking at F2, uh, F2X. So now we're going to look at F1. And F1 was really, a, that was a struggle for me, because you don't have any angles here. You just have these uh, three over, four back, and then we go up 12. And so this is one where, at least for me, doing the, uh, using the unit vector approach, where we just, uh, we take the, um, so this is F1. The, uh, the force vector is the resultant times the uh, or, or, or multiplied by the unit vector, right? I don't know if that's the right the standard way of, uh, of doing that, but um, and uh, so this unit vector here is is going to be the. Uh, we, we take the, because we're given the, the, the x, y, and z distances, so we can uh, take the x distance is 3, right? So 3i plus 12j minus 4k. And I'm seeing that, I'm thinking, oh, wow, complex numbers. AC circuits, three phase. Yeah, let me add it. And then I come back to reality and says, oh, no, it's, it's statics. <laughs> Mechanics, not electricity. But uh, I do this a lot with electrical stuff, but pretty rarely. But you remember in electric power, we have the same, we can represent circuits in a similar, you know, uh, uh, reactances and things like that. Well, I and J. Okay, so that's our, uh, that's our, our unit vector. And uh, that means, uh, Oh no, we have to divide it. We have to divide by the magnitude, sum of the right? We have to divide by the uh, three squared plus twelve squared um, plus four squared, right? Uh, that's thirteen. So we 
we end up with 3i plus 12j minus 4k over 13. So now uh, we, we can uh, we, we can calculate the uh, the resultant or the, the net. is going to be f2x plus f1x, right, or minus 46.9 uh, plus 30, minus 46, equals negative 16.9, our y is f2y plus f1y, which is 86.8 um, plus 120 is 206.8 and our z is f2 f2 z plus f1 z equals f2 z 17.4 minus 40 is negative 22.6 okay so there, those are our the components of our resultant, and, and then we can calculate the magnitude of the resultant by summing the squares of all those, um, plus 20, uh, 206.8 squared, plus, plus, uh, I have to be careful here because my calculator will mess this up if I'm, if I'm not careful, 20 minus 20 squared, because that's going to be positive. Um, and actually, I usually just put all positive numbers in here so I, I don't inadvertently add a negative number. And we 
get 209 newtons for our resultant. <clears throat> so this, this was, uh, all this stuff is going to go out to be 209 newtons for the magnitude. And, uh, and then the, uh, the directions, we have to go, uh, we'll just take the cosine of each of the uh, direction angles here. So in the x direction, negative, or rx, so this is going to be rx over r, right, magnitude, or negative 16.9 over 209. Uh, cosine of theta y is r y over r, or 206.8 over 209, and then cosine z r z over r equals minus 22.6 over 209, right? And you know you. You do all this in your calculator, and this is uh, this is going to give us uh, uh, theta theta x is uh, uh, ninety four point six degrees, and then theta y is eighty eight point three. It's really small angle because it's almost one. So uh, eight point three degrees, and the z angle. Uh, Can't read what I wrote. Ninety-six point two. That's yeah, that's all right. Ninety-six point two. Yeah, there you go. All right. So man, that's a that, that that's like a that, that problem is like a one problem review of force uh, systems of force analysis, isn't it? Using all the different ways we can represent forces. Yes, sir. Uh, so we have about three minutes to do the, the multiple choice questions on, yes. on the test. Um, for a question like this, is this one you would want to spend more time with, or is there a strategy of how to? Oh, that, 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 this isn't a, a this is, wouldn't be a test question. This is God. a review. This is a review. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at it, it's like, how how am I supposed to do this? And, or get no, it, close to a reasonable guess in three minutes. Yeah, a test a, a test question might give you that and ask for one component or okay. something. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to do one where I just went through the whole thing to do a, 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 a comprehensive analysis of the system. No, I see the value now, absolutely. But number one would be, a, I think, a, a, an example, a representative example of a test question. Okay? All right, so. Uh, Fun, fun with forces, and then we uh, we can have fun with couples and moments as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, moments about a point express the tendency of a body to resist rotation, right? I used to always confuse, why, why do we just use moments? I mean, it's a torque, isn't it torque? I mean, force resistance is a torque. What's the difference? Static. Moment is for statics, and torque is for when you have rotation. So that's my understanding is the moment is when uh, the system is um, it, 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 it's experiencing a stress and, and maybe it's about it's on the verge of moving but it's not actually it, it, it's a tendency to want to rotate but when it starts rotating then we say oh it's torque but uh, honestly I think people just confuse, you know confuse the terms I actually don't I rarely see moment used outside of statics talking about statics, but anyway, um, no, I take that back. I have, I actually have dealt with moments when it comes to loading of, uh, of large compressors and pumps and things like that. I think I, I have had to deal with that. <sighs> okay, moments, uh, moment is like forces, they're vectors. It is the cross product of the position vector and the force vector. And oh my God, I hope you don't get a cross product question. I hate it. Don't you hate this? You got to set up a little matrix and do the Kramer's rule. You, you, you know, remember that, right? Doing cross products? 
Yeah, you do it in fluid mechanics when when you have a flows that have angular components to them. I never in my professional life have I ever had a flow like that. But we talk about that in fluid mechanics. Um, curl, curl is another interesting. One. But uh, yeah, so the cross of the of the resultant, uh, it's kind of that's like torque as well. Um, so the moments uh, can be, the components of the moment can be written out uh, this way, and this is in the reference handbook if you, if you need it. Um, the line of action, you, know, you use the right hand rule, you know, wrap your right hand around the, you know, you grab, you know, grab that radius, right, the R, and push it into the force, and then your thumb points in the direction of the, uh, of the moment. And then a couple, what's a couple? A couple, you get parallel forces that are parallel in opposite directions, about a point in between them. <coughs> and uh, you can move a couple around anywhere, right? And it, it doesn't change the, the, the exhibit's effect on the system. A couple induces rotation that only another couple can counteract. Uh, the moment of a couple is the product of the force and, and the distance between the points of application. Um, so here's an example of a, this is a kind of cool one, that has a couple in it. A couple of couples. It's one couple. What would be its moment about O? Zero, right? Why? No radial. No radial component. It's 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 the forces in line with the uh, whatever the force is in, in in the line of the line of action is is at the point. Um, then there is no moment, right? Pull, you know, pull. That's where you know the kid's going to grow up to be a mechanical engineer. You see them pulling on. That, you know, thinking they're gonna rotate. Now, why is this thing not rotating? <laughs> that would be me. Yeah, you know, I pulled the break the rope trying to rotate the thing. Okay, um, that's why I played with chemistry sets rather than uh, mechanical stuff when I was a kid. <laughs> Disc. So we got 320 newton force in addition. So we have this couple, all these forces. So we're going we're gonna to pull out the forces and there and replace them with a single 320 newton force acting at point B. Uh, so that we're going to act point B is on the rim of the disc, and but it's parallel to the original 320 newton force. So what most nearly would the angle theta be to maintain uh, equilibrium? <coughs> And uh, let's see. So you know when you do moments, uh, you, you assume a direction of positive rotation, right? So uh, I, I would always draw something like that. And you know, that would be my, my assumption. And I do the same on my coordinate axes as well. Uh, usually it's the normal you know, positive to the right, but some, sometimes it's convenient to do weird things. But. OK. so. Um, Tell me, where, where would you start here? What, what would you want to do? That's the key to these problems, right? It's starting. It's, 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 it's you know, how do I start? Because that really determines your, how you solve it. Yeah. So are we trying to set theta up so that the moment at O is equivalent based on that new 320 newton force? It's kind of, yes. It's kind of yeah. confusing. 
Yeah, so the 320 Newton, the, the new 320 Newton as force B, so we get rid of the, 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 the solid line 320 and we move to the dotted line there. And um, so our moment, uh, we still have to have a zero moment around O, right? Um, yes. Yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, the idea is we'd be setting the, we'd be setting the moments that would be equal to the original yes. Newtons and then setting that equal to, it looks like that's going to be the Y component of that. It's the only thing that's going to be acting through the axis. That that's sense? right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Thank you. That's that right. makes more sense now that it's moved. Yeah. So if you, if you look at this, if you look at this force where it's located here, um, is the X component going to have a, an effect? On the moment, no. It's just yeah, the right. Y component, and that has to that has to equal the couple, the, the effect of the couple, the moment of the couple. So we first need to figure out what the what the moment of the couple is. Um, so that's going to be what 40, 40 newtons is the the force times the uh, the diameter, right? Or, or twice the radius, or the, do we have the diameter here? Is it four, four centimeters? Um, the radius is four centimeters, so I want to uh, have four centimeters times two. And that's going to give us, uh, actually, we're going to have to put a negative sign here because I'm defining rotation uh, positive in the clockwise and the couple is taking us counterclockwise, right? So this is going to be 300, negative 320. Okay, so uh, the, the so the moment of that new force FB has to equal minus 320. Okay, so the moment, so this is with the new force, is it F, F, B, only the Y component has a moment about O, and so we have the moment is equal to minus 320 newton centimeters equals stuff we can do with 
just applying this to conditions. <clears throat> so now we can torment ourselves with yet another three dimensional. This one also caused me to want to just tear my hair out because, uh, of course, um, and this, this, this seems to be common with these problems, the FD exam problems, is they don't give you all the dimensions which force you to use tr trigonometry to find the dimension that you need. Yes, sir. Can I have a question on the last problem? Yes, sir. Uh, just conceptually, if all the forces are making the disk go counterclockwise, wouldn't it make sense that it would be equilibrium? Wouldn't you need like another force acting clockwise where it could be equilibrium? Oh. So, so what I think what no I agree with you. I think the I think what it mentioned was that you're removing the two you're, you're removing the couple. Oh, so okay. it's saying if you remove the other uh, the other couple, what would be equivalent? But yes, I agree. If if this were equilibrium and we were solving for it and we kept the other parts, then yes, you'd be right. You'd have to the it would have to be rotating the other direction. Right. That's that was it. So this one here, to maintain some equilibrium, what is the tension in cable cable BE? Oh dear. Cable BE. So the, the, the one redeeming grace of this problem is at least it has symmetry, right? The two cables are equidistant from the center line. And, um, so we really only have to look at one cable and, and multiply it by two. It's, it's effect by two, and, uh, and that would deal with both of them. Um, and we have that 1,000 Newton force at C that's acting to pull the pole down toward the left, and it's being restrained by the two cables there. <sighs> so, how would you? solve this problem, which point would you focus on? A, B, C, D? Start with B. Start with C. Start, Start with C. Find the moment that creates an A. Mm -hmm. And then I'll tell you what you need to resist it. And then just go yeah. B and find what moment is opposite and then just go to the moment too. Right. Yeah, that's conceptually what we're doing is we're, we're, we're this thing is, is being rotated about A. It's being pulled to the left by the thousand newton force and we're restraining it up to the right with uh, the cables. So we're gonna take, we're gonna take a moment about A. We have symmetry, it's BE and BB. And what we need here, BE, we need the lengths of the cables, right? Need the lengths of the cables, which are hypotenuse. There, uh, the cable is a hypotenuse of a triangle. And if you think of a triangle is coming down, and then if between A and E, that's the base of the triangle. Yeah. So to get the hypotenuse, to get the length BE, we need the distance AE. So it's like a double application of, of the Pythagorean theorem here. So BE. Yes. Do you have to use the Pythagorean theorem, or could you look at that and know that that would be a 45 degree angle? That that would be a, a 45, 45, 90? Does that make sense? So 45, what, what would be a 45 degree, the, the angle A? So the angle between E, yeah, the angle between E and then say the, So then that, yeah. that, that distance would be 12 times, uh, oh, is it, I think it's 12 times 2 
square root of two, I think, correct? We, so we want to have to use Pythagorean theorem for that, correct? Yeah. Well, well, because I thought we needed that. 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 On the length, you just do the square root of fourteen squared plus twelve squared plus twelve squared. That would be the total length. And then we'll divide well, the by that. that will give you the unit vector for y. Yeah, yeah. I think you could you could do it that way. Okay, my bad. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, So what I what I what I the way I, I did I work this okay we need the moment about about a and that is going to be zero at equilibrium and if we define positive is clockwise we're going to have the what we need is the component of the tension force. We've got the tension force BE, and we need the component of it along the x-axis, right? We need the component of BD and BE along the x-axis, and we multiply that by the R. R is 14. <coughs> and uh, so Going clockwise, we've got the two cables, and um, and then we have the the magnitude of force, and then the component of the force in the x direction times the radial distance, which is. Fourteen, and then we subtract the effect of the one thousand newtons. That is twenty meters. Okay. So be twelve. Yeah, where the twenty-two comes from. Twenty-two is the length. Of BE or BD, and that's equal to the square root of 14, which is the, so we're making a triangle A, B, D, A, A, B, D, A, A, B, D, A. And that distance AE is 16.97. Can you get that number 16.97 with the square root of 12 squared plus 12 squared? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, because this is the hypotenuse of the triangle that has length 12 on that side and 12 on that side. So we're 12 squared, square root of 12 squared plus 12 squared equals the square root of the hypotenuse, and then this is the base of the triangle from E to B to A. And, uh, and then this gives us 22, and that goes in the denominator here. And then the component that we're looking for here for our, uh, our moment is 12 over 22. 
And when you multiply, or at least when you solve for FBE, or FBE from symmetry, we get 1310 newtons, okay? So tell me, how do these compare with problems you did in statics class? Are these harder than statics problems? Or are they, they seem representative of what you did in statics? Yeah, it's about the same. About the same. This is a good, uh, these problems are good math review as well because the math section of the uh, of the exam, which we don't cover in here, has a fair bit of trigonometry and vectors uh, and matrices as well. And being able to do a three by three, calculated determinant or um, the uh, cofactors, co things like that. Do you remember, remember how to do that? Um, that's all on there too. Yeah, so take a break and uh, five minutes break and we'll come back and finish off. You might say that it already is. <laughs> yes. Yeah. gonna uh, not do more problems. I want to let you all do work on a couple of problems you, yourself without me uh, yapping at you. So I'll just go through here and, and we'll look at what's the rest of the material that's covered. So um, with static equilibrium problems you need to know something about the uh, the member and how the member is connected to a support. Right? You all remember this? You have different uh, different pins, different supports, uh, and so on, and depending on the nature of that, how the member mates with a surface, that determines the number of, of unknowns and the number of, of equations that you can write for that member. And the simplest case would be like a roller pin on a smooth surface because it can only move in one direction. Um, you have a hinge pin where you have a uh, two reaction forces, and uh, similarly with a, a rough surface, we have a smooth surface, this is only one reaction force. And then we get to the, 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 the joints or, and connections where you have uh, moments, so a fixed connection, like a, um, yeah, or a ball and socket joint where you can move in three Dimensions here are a fixed connection where now you have, uh, you have you have reaction forces as well as moments around uh, x y uh, and z, and uh, these are you know these drawings are not going to be in the handbook, so you have to just remember these when you see one. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask, do we need to know the different types of loading conditions for different types of bearings? Because uh, if I remember right, there's a couple different types of bearings that were in this originally in the statics textbook. Some of them would allow moments and, and forces in certain directions. Yeah, so I think that's we have to another. Memorize that too. I, I, I'm not sure, but okay. I think that's in another uh, subject area of the exam. Okay, thank you. Just wanted maybe, to ask. Maybe it's machine design or curve that machine design too. Or solid. Yeah, but I think it is. So it's, it's just in a new section. Okay. Okay, thank you. Being able to figure out whether a system is statically determinate or statically indeterminate, if it's statically indeterminate, which members can you take out and still have a stable system? So you might have problems like that. They might be just, you, you look at something and you, you know, that looks like, you know, maybe I have to take this out. And uh, so it'd be a statically indeterminate system. Um, 
And, uh, and then there's a little procedure that is uh, you can use when working through these kinds of problems uh, where you, you're having to, 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 to determine uh, forces within uh, you know, a multi-member uh, system at static equilibrium. You're defining your coordinate axis, free body diagram. If it's a pen support, resolving the reaction forces and the components. So we try to get the reaction forces first is, is a common approach. Um, and once you get those reaction forces, then you can put them into moment equations and find uh, other forces you know, as needed. Define your positive direction of rotation. Write the equilibrium equation for the moments. Um, and uh, with your, your horizontal component, vertical component. And, uh, and then finding the other unknown reaction force and uh, and the necessary combining horizontal and vertical components to get the resultant at a pin connection. Um, and then there's a there's an example here, um, which is uh, this is not too bad, not too complicated, but involves uh, a moment and uh, reaction forces. Then trusses, our favorite. Uh, things here. Um, some trusses are statically determinate, some may not be, um, and uh, sometimes we need to figure out which members are not uh, load-bearing. Those can be easy parts of problems because you can eliminate those from your, uh, from your equilibrium analysis if they're not load-bearing. Um, both members uh, of an apex are, are not load-bearing, for example, or if you have uh, you know two two members that join at a at a joint, and then the third member comes out of that joint, that third member is uh, uh, is not force-bearing, or a zero force member. And then this is a rule for to be statically determined: the number of members twice the number of joints minus three. And if this number, this number is greater than the right side, then um, you have more members than needed for stability. If this number is less, this side is less than the right side, you don't want to go on that bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Collins probably designed it. <laughs> and, uh, and he's left the country and changed his identity. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, so so trust the method of joints, you know, going joint by joint, which is nice when you need to get uh, forces for a, you know, a lot of the members in the truss. Um, and uh, and then if you're you're going deep into the truss or you know, there's only one or two members that you're really interested in using the method of sections. And uh, the method of sections is uh, really making this work depends a lot on how you cut through the truss, right? What, what members you generally, you wanna no more than three, you don't wanna cut through more than three because you only wanna have three, equa uh, three equations for three unknowns, um, the two reaction forces in the moment. Uh, so, for example, uh, where would you want to cut this one through? If you're looking for the force in member DE, where, where would you want to cut that? Really, somewhere that goes through DE. Okay, yeah, so somewhere through DE. Maybe diagonally, yeah, kind of that direction. Yeah, something like that, DE, maybe DE, CE, and DF. That's, I think that's my solution. I did it that way. Um, and then, you know, you, you've got just DE hanging off of this joint here, and it makes it easier to, to analyze it. Um, yeah, this one's kind of interesting, too. Finding the forces in each of those, uh, in each of these members is, is a good little exercise just to get back into the feel of, of using the method of joints. And moving joint to joint, and you've got your uh, joints in compression, joints in tension, right? So the force that's going in compression, you know, that they always, uh, forces all go point away from each other, right? From the joint. Um, and uh, 
Then static friction. Uh, working with the static friction equation, force is proportional to the normal the normal force, which is uh, the, 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 the normal force is the component of the gravitational force that is normal to the surface, the normal to the plane on which the, the body is resting. Um, when the, the surface is at an angle theta, then the, uh, the, the force is multiplied by the cosine of that angle. So that would be you know, the famous ramp problems where you've got a box sitting on a ramp and you want to figure out what the friction force is and things like that. Um, that's the kind of problem we want to run into here. Um, dynamic friction, so just knowing the difference, because dynamic friction deals with, with, now we're getting into dynamics, and that's not part of statics. That will be on the dynamics part of the exam. But, so the dynamic friction uh, coefficient is about 75% of the static friction. So once you, once you uh, break inertia and you begin to move, then the friction coefficient drops off. Dynamic friction, <clears throat> and uh, oh, here it is—a you know, famous load sitting on a ramp problem. I somehow I just got these memories of I have memories of doing this in physics as a student, but I can't remember doing this in stat statics. I must must have done that. And uh, so then belts and pulleys, uh, understanding how friction works in a. Uh, transmits torque from one uh, side of the pulley to the other. And uh, then there's an equation that relates the two tension forces in the pulley. You've got one tight side and one loose side, right? And uh, the two the forces in the two, the loose side and the tight side, relate to each other by this equation here, which has e to the, uh, we have the static friction, or static friction coefficient and the angle between where the, the cables are tangent to the pulley. And then there's an example here of um, finding the minimum tension in one of these is this one here, this cable required to prevent slippage given the radius of the, the shiv and uh, the coefficient of static friction. So a lot of these just seem to be more plug-in problems where you're given the parameters and you, you pull the right equation. And uh, th these are given in the, uh, this one is given in the, in the reference handbook. Um, and then uh, another possible application is in a screw where you're tightening a screw against tension or, or loosening a screw. And uh, you're given the uh, radius of the screw, the pitch of the threads, and pitch angle. And you want to find out the moment required. And then the moment where you just, uh, just before you begin to, to turn, to, to, to rotate the screw, um, what that moment would be. And this is how we can calculate it. And uh, there's an example of a square thread screw problem here. And then we uh, the final part is uh, centroids and moments of inertia. Um, and uh, there's some definitions here. The centroid is uh, just deals with the area of the object. Uh, you, you know, people often think of it as the, cent where the point where the center of gravity, center of gravity, but that's not exactly the same thing. Um, the centroid is defined not without, it's independent of any forces acting on the, um, on the body. It's just related to its, the area. If you could take all, you know, the, the, the entire extent of the object and sort of collapse it into one point. Um, and then formulas for calculating the, the centroid, the area and the centroid are given for a, a whole range of not, not as nearly as many as there are, but just a few common ones. And I just pulled two out here to show the, the information given. So the area and the centroid for the x and the y coordinates. Uh, and then the area moment of inertia 
what is the first moment of euphoria. There's all these strange terms that I've that just always confused me, but um, the uh, yeah, so you can calculate. You can calculate out what these coordinates are. The centroid, the, uh, if you take the, uh, the integral, an integration of the, 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 the elements of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the shape, the different parts of it, uh, you integrate across and then divide by the total area. Um, but for the most part, we, we, we always look these up in, in tables. And uh, so that would be for calculating the centroid, the centroid coordinates, then the moments of inertia, or the second moment of the area, the product of the area of an element and the square of its distance from the axis. And uh, so this is the me this is a in measure of a body's capacity to resist torsion, twisting, bending, no, not torsion, but bending. Um, and uh, the moment of inertia with respect to an axis passing through the centroid is the centroidal moment of inertia. So it has the I x, I y, this little c to indicate that it's about the centroid, an axis going through the centroid rather than um, you know, the zero of the, of, the, of the coordinate system. Then the polar moment of inertia is we sum the x and the y. Component, um, that would be the moment with respect to a z axis. J is the uh, polar moment of inertia. And, uh, and then if we know the moment of inertia about one axis, we can find it about another axis that's parallel to the original axis using the parallel axis theorem, theorem which displaces the x and the y by this amount equal to d. For the, uh, on the x side, the distance from the y axis times the area, and then for the y moment of inertia using the distance from the x axis. And uh, so all of these formulas are given, and there's the radius of gyration, which you might be interested in if you're, um, which we can calculate using the moments of inertia and the polar moment of inertia. Then the final number here, the uh, product of inertia, uh, the integral of x, y, dA, um, and we can use the parallel axis theorem for that as well. So really, the 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 the, the formula that you need to calculate these are going to be all tabulated like this. So here's our area moment of inertia. Uh, so about the, the, the x for the centroid, and then for just about the axis general radius of gyration and product of inertia that we need to do the calculation. And really the, you know, the challenge here is when we have composite bodies, right? There are combinations of, of, of various bodies here, or when we have something like this, but it's uh, maybe it's upside down, or it's, uh, it's displaced from the axis, and that's where we get into having to you know, think about it. How do we, you know, the sum you know, for a composite, you have to sum the, uh, the values for its components and things like that. And uh, which is why uh, in the examples, uh, so here's a, a common application where we have, uh, we're looking for the centroid coordinate, which is one of the coordinates here. Uh, if, but we have a composite of two simple objects. But instead of summing them, we subtract out the uh, the contribution from the, the semicircle here. So we take the triangle, we find where the centroid x coordinate is, and then we, we subtract out the part that would be uh, contributed by the semicircle. And then here we have another composite structure where we would have the sum of the, the, the contribution of the moment of inertia from this rectangle and the contribution from that rectangle. And we're looking for it about the x-axis here. And, uh, and that one sits right on the x-axis. And you know, we can imagine the, another problem where it would be all displaced a little bit, and maybe use the parallel axis theorem. And uh, so that really you know, that rounds out what you would be expected to know for 
the statics part. I hope this was helpful. Um, it, it, it was fun to kind of go through this and it brought me back to stuff that I hadn't thought about in a long time. Um, yeah, do you have any questions or? Which is more fun, statics or thermodynamics? <laughs> statics. <laughs>